Uh, hey, we got a few people jumping on. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, sorry, Abby. I am running. I didn't, uh, I was, I was experimenting at the last second is my problem. Uh, with some trying to get the, uh, the chat, <clears throat> trying to get the Discord chat to, uh, to project back out, which I can get it. I just need to, I just keep getting busy with other stuff. Um, let me see. Let me see. What are we talking about? Probably something important. Oh, I remember what we were going to do. We were on assembly language. Bum, bum, bum. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that seems right now, doesn't it? Okay, we got 10 concurrent. Uh, we are also, uh, if you want to, you can um, uh, track the uh, audio by jumping on the Discord channel and <clears throat> jumping on the voice chat there, and you can hear my voice you know, more real time. Uh, then the slides will be delayed, or you can do the whole thing on YouTube Live. Um, so, anyway, how's everybody doing? How y'all doing? How you holding up? Um, you can either, uh, I guess it's just me and Abby on the voice, on the voice channel on Discord right now, but, uh, anyway, if you want to drop a comment in the chat on, uh, YouTube live stream, that would be great. Just kind of curious how you're all holding up. Um, okay, let me hit, uh, let me hit a few things. We're at, we're at 11, that's a small number, but we'll, uh, I'm sure it'll bump up here as people are kind of joining in. Um, and then just as a reminder, you can always just hit my YouTube channel. I try to make a post to the Discord channel as well, but you can also hit my, my YouTube channel. And basically the, the live stream is just going to be there. Um, everybody staying healthy? Anybody being affected uh, directly by this? Family members, friends going down with the virus? Are we uh, doing okay still? Um, okay. Okay, should we, uh, should we talk about this assembly process, kind of dive in? Uh, by the way, <clears throat> so just as a reminder, um, all, of the, all of the module exams, everything is uh, being done, you know, on Canvas. And you got to check in with us, uh, either me or Talmud or Devin. Um, we are fine, you know, answering questions kind of any time uh, that you can catch us, right? Just understand, uh, you know, just, just understand we may not, be, you know, be able to, like, uh, park and go through stuff with you at 1 in the morning or whatever. But if you do catch us, we really don't mind. We just understand how disrupted everything is. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is the, the actual number... Um, the actual number of exams that are happening is that number is too low. Okay. And, but what happens is that we have to, you got to ping us just like you would in the testing lobby, ping us. And then we will open up the exam for you and it'll be open only for you. Uh, and then you've got an hour to do that. If you need more time, then you just check in with us, you know, shouldn't need more time than that. Um, if you have done the homework and you've done the homework, you know, honestly, uh, if you, you know, whatever, like 
copied the homework from someplace just to get it done, then, you know, A, you're doing it wrong, um, and B, you're not going to be really competent, you know, to do whatever you do. But if you've done the homework well, properly, then you should be able to jump on and, and be just fine uh, with the exams, in, you know, any one of the module exams in less than an hour. So that's kind of how we're doing. But, but anyway, I fear that we're, it just feels like we're a little behind the curve on the exams. Uh, so Tanner asked, you know, what exams should we have done up till now? Well, we are on, we're wrapping up module eight today, which means to be caught up with where we're at, you should have module seven done. And the reality is there's something that I can do more readily here, but I want to just see something. Um, module seven, um, remote module seven, four, five only has five people that have taken module seven uh, via Canvas. And then I think there's also some, um, you know, that maybe did it on paper, you know, prior to spring break. Just curious. We've got to transfer some of these over. Yeah, there was one that had done module seven before spring break. Yeah, so like literally only like half a dozen. So, and then we're hitting module eight right now. We're going to finish that today and we'll jump on um, module nine uh, today. So, um, okay. So any other, any other questions um, that you've got? Uh, the other thing, too, is, you know, one of the questions has been, what about, uh, you know, I mean, time's running out, and which is true, and what are we doing, you know, how's it, how's it working time-wise? And, and the answer is, uh, the later ones, they speed up. We've only got, you know, three weeks, counting this week, uh, left in the semester. Um, we're going to, you know... Uh, we're going to be a little more accommodating on, on some of the deadlines. But um, some of these lectures, some of the modules, you know, we're, at, we're wrapping up Module 8 today. Module 9 is really a discussion about, which one is it that's mostly missing, Module 9 or Module 10? Um, I think... Sorry, I haven't looked at it for quite a while. Um, I actually think it's probably module... I think it's module 9 that was intended to be more of a discussion about design and about thinking through those kinds of things. Uh, I'm just looking here real quick. Yeah, that's right. Module 9 is the flex. So we're going to basically spend, you know, a little of today and a little of next time kind of wrapping Module 9. And then, boom, we're going to be on Module 10 with two and a half weeks to go. And then uh, uh, 10, 11, 12, they just go a lot faster. The, the good news is also I think the modules are shorter, the material is shorter, the homework is shorter, the exams are shorter. So, yeah, it pops. Well, I kind of told you that, you know, when we started and a few points along the way that it does start popping. Um, but it's not, the, the difference is um, at the very beginning, you know, we were dealing with, um, uh, you know, we had uh, just, you know, two solid weeks on like one module because the module's dealing with just fundamental underlying concepts. When you get to things like, the stack, you know, at the end, it's not a really super hard concept. And it's sort of like one thing. And we'll kind of find that, you know, that it, it really, the material uh, sort of in a sense gets easier and faster, okay, down the stretch. 
So unlike some of the earlier modules, which there's just so much foundational when you're figuring out the bits and everything, it's, you know, a lot harder. Uh, it goes a little slower. So, um, okay. Let me, any other questions? Um, so, yeah, reach out to us so we can open up those module exams, okay, when you need them. Make sure you get the homework done. And uh, like I said, we'll start talking today about, about the, uh, the uh, project, final project. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, I think we're still dealing with uh, like a 20-second delay from my broadcast to when it uh, pops out to you guys on YouTube Live. Um, I even uh, managed to configure a wired Ethernet connection to my laptop in my home office um, to take the latency down to about zilch. Um, I'm literally at about a gigabit throughput um, wired to my laptop. But once you go across the interwebs, everything slows down. So, okay. Um, anything else? Anything else you guys got? Pretty quiet, pretty quiet crowd here today. Okay, so here's what we're talking about. We're talking about, um, this is the end of, uh, of chapter seven, module eight. Uh, let me see, Chase. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, are they open for an hour after you open them to start? Or are they open for however long and then you have an hour time frame to take the test? No, they, we actually open them up for an hour. So you need to like kind of uh, ping us and then we'll basically say, okay, we're, open, we're opening it up now. And then you've got an hour from that point, okay? Um, as opposed to leaving it wide open and then you've got, you know, an hour from when you start. I hope that makes sense. Um, and uh, Jean-Lin, uh, I think you're talking about Microsoft Teams, which I basically just decided against. Uh, toyed around a little bit and decided that this still has some things that are generally easier, better, cleaner. And so we're just going to kind of roll with it. We still have the latency built in, which is the biggest downside. And if you want to bypass that latency, jump on Discord. And then you can just, uh, I've got a voice channel that's broadcasting on Discord. And you'll get that with basically no latency. The downside being that then the slides are coming 20 seconds after you hear it on, on Discord. But you can at least be a lot more interactive in terms of, you know, jumping on and asking questions or whatever on Discord. Getting your voice is nice. Okay. So what we're going to talk about uh, to start today, and this will wrap up the module, is this process by which we actually take assembly language and turn it into machine code. That's bottom line, right? We've been, we've been writing code using machine code, right? Which is just, in the case of the LC3, it's just 16 bits. And first, you know, you know what the layout is for for the opcodes, you know, three bits for the destination register, blah, 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 depending upon the format, right? So we've been writing in that form. Now we're going to, you know, we've introduced the idea, if we, you know, kind of go back, right? We introduced the idea right here of assembly instructions with labels, opcodes, operands, and comments, right? Well, what we want to do now, uh, and pseudo ops, which we talked about, and trap codes, we now have everything we need to write assembly language programs, okay? And so what we're going to do is talk about how you take an assembly language program like that one, and how, do you, you know, how does the assembler walk through this thing to turn that into binary, okay, to turn that into machine code. And this turns out to be somewhat important um, for a handful of reasons, but it, it basically, you know, gives you, uh, you know, there's, there's clearly a direct relationship between assembly language instruction and a machine language, you know, instruction. Uh, and embodied in that translation is sort of like a reinforcement of sort of key ideas. 
that we've been talking about. Okay, so that's what we're going to kind of walk through. Um, there are two passes, and by two passes, what that means is here's your code, and the assembler is going to like walk through every line of code on a first pass. Then it's going to go to the back to the top again and go down through it again. Okay, and the reason that we do that is first of all we we the the in both cases on the passes we start at the beginning of the file or the beginning of the the code and then we stop that process when we get to the dot end remember we talked about how the dot end you know it wants to say the end of your program but it it really isn't it is the end of this process right now of assembling so i can do some then i can do another set having it go somewhere else, another set, have it go somewhere else, things like that. It does tell the assembler to stop assembling, okay? The first pass through, the reason we go through it is to build a symbol table. All those loops, sorry, loops. Loop was, if you remember, loop was the name of the, uh, of the label we were using as an example. Um, but all those labels, right? Like, you know, again, number, six, references out here, right? All of that, you got to store that away. You've got to kind of hang on to that information. And you kind of need to know what that is, first of all, where that, what that, you know, we talked about these things being kind of like, um, sort of like nicknames or, or uh, uh, synonyms or, you know, some kind of symbolic representation. They do reference specific spots in memory, right? So the first pass is really just about building the symbol table. The symbol table tells us, oh, here's a label, and here's what instruction that one refers to. So that when somebody else references the label, they're going to know, you know, how to clean it up, right? If it's a PC offset, they're going to know, you know, how to calculate that offset. And then the second pass, where are we at? The second pass is where I'm actually now converting all the individual instructions one at a time into machine language, okay? And then, as I said, you can separately assemble different chunks of code, okay? That each one has its own .org and its own .in. I can put those in different locations. If I use the same .org, what's gonna happen? Any guesses on that one? I know uh, we've only got three people uh, besides me on the voice chat. But what would happen, what would happen? If you uh, if you just reuse the same .org and had different code every time, any ideas? If you're on Discord, you can just open up, you know, unmute and just share your thoughts. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for comments. What would happen? Come on, is everybody asleep? Is everybody asleep? Am I broadcasting? Are you guys seeing this? Can I get a can I get a head nod from from somebody on uh, on either Discord or uh, YouTube chat? Yeah, so thanks, Zach. Uh, yeah, right. It's just gonna it's just gonna overwrite every time you did it. It would go to the same spot. And it's just gonna overwrite it, you know. Um, and uh, so you can do this, but you want to set up uh, you want to set up a different dot origin, a different location. So if I want to separately compile my program, as we get into our, our final project, you know, there's some situations where you might actually want to do that. Um, you might want to have all of your states from the state machine we're going to do, you might want to have all of those, uh, you know, in different locations. And then I just create a table of all of those addresses, just hard coded. And I can use that table almost like a jump table, right? So I can set up all my function calls. Um, you know, 
So yeah, um, yeah, Vlad, the question was what would happen if you just reuse the .orig, you know? I was talking about how you can compile separately, and I was saying you got to put a different .orig every single time, .orig 3000, .orig, you know, 3050 or whatever, right? And the reason is because if you just use the same one and you assemble, it'll take that and it'll put it all in 3000. And you do it again with some other code, puts it right over in 3000. It's just going to overwrite it over and over and over again. That was kind of really where the, where the punchline was. Um, okay, so let's keep rolling. Let's keep rolling. Thanks for helping me not feel so alone, everybody that dropped a comment. Um, hang on a second. All right. Okay, you ready? Um, one of the other things that happens in this process that we call assembly, the reason we call this assembly language, or sometimes it'll be called assembler, but um, it's because this process is, it's, I don't even know, know exactly why we call it this. It's assembling from this assembly language into machine language. I don't know. It's a slightly funky name, but one of the things that we can do is detect errors. Like for example, if I if I create a label that I never use, no harm done. If I reference a label that never got declared, that's a problem because I get to that line and it's like I don't have I don't know how to reconcile that. I don't know how to clean it up. You know? Because you know, that happens sometimes where you're just getting a little sloppy or you're moving too fast. Sometimes you do a typo, you type the name of the label wrong and then you don't you know, you can't see um, where it's going. But so sometimes it'll, um, sometimes it's things like that where I don't know, you know, I don't see, uh, I don't see a label. Uh, understand that the, the assembler isn't going to detect logic errors. Meaning if you, you know, the assembler trusts that you know what you're doing logically. Uh, it's just going to worry mostly about syntax. You blow the syntax. Um, or if you don't, um, you might say things that actually don't make any sense. Like you might use an instruction, and the instruction has like a PC offset 9. And when you do a PC offset 9, if you remember, you've got a limited space plus or minus, you know, from the, from the program counter. And then you, what you do, though, in assembly language is instead of giving it a number, you give it a label. Now, when you're doing machine language, you have to put the number right there. There's no way to get it wrong in machine language because you put the number in, you've only got so many bits, and every possible bit pattern in that number is a valid bit pattern uh, that's going to move you plus or minus. But now you can say, you know, do this thing with some label like, you know, whatever, loop or some label. And that label might be actually outside the range of what you can actually do, um, you know, with, with the bits you've got available in the instruction, okay? And so the assembler, essentially the assembler is going to try to just make assembly instructions uh, into machine instructions. Anytime it fails or can't, it's going to throw an error. And it might throw an error because you said... Instead of add, you said, you know, a, instead of and, you said Andy, little typo. It's like, look in, it doesn't know the instruction called Andy, so it's going to throw up its hands. Anything that causes it to not be able to do its thing is going to be a problem. That's all, that's all the assembly errors really are. All right, everybody cool with that? Um, okay, so here comes our example of an assembly, this process of assembling uh, assembly language into binary, okay? So first of all, let's just kind of understand what this program is doing. We got some comments here, right? That tells us what it's doing. It's counting down. Oh, sorry. It's going to start everybody yawning. Um, we do the dot .orig, which says where we want to put this stuff in memory starting at location 3001. We can, have, we can set that to anything we want. Um, there's a load instruction which takes this value right there. That's, that's 10. 
and it's in this location that we label 10. We use the dot fill as a pseudo op. And that basically just says load the value from this location into R1. And then we start decrementing R1, right? Branch on positive back to loop. That goes 10 times. And when we're done, we just halt. Okay. So first pass, um, we go, we start building the symbol table. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things that are, that are going to be fairly obvious and one that's maybe less obvious. Uh, first of all, the symbol table really does kind of look sort of like this. The symbol is the text, like, like loop or 10, things like that. That goes here as the symbol. The address is what's, the re what's that address going to be in memory, okay? When, when you load this thing into memory, What's that address going to be? Now, remember we did a dot orage, right? 3001. That's going to be the address of this load instruction. That, this add here that we label loop is going to be at location 3002. That's going to be 3, 4, and this 10 label is going to be at 3005. We need to get those values. We need to wind up with loop in the symbol table and its proper address, 10 and its address. It's all based upon this dot orage, okay? About where we're gonna put that in memory, okay? So, and then the other thing is that we'll talk a little bit about it, but this location counter, LC is location counter. Now it's, it's based on the program counter. Problem is, and this is really important, at this point, the pro, this program's not running. Okay, there's another program called the assembler that's reading through your program or, you know, like it's in the simulator, right? In the LC3 simulator, it's reading through your program and just kind of going, okay, that'll need to be here. This will need to be there. And then it starts putting instructions into memory. Okay, there's no program counter because the program hasn't started running yet. But the location counter, it's almost like a like an advanced view of what the program counter will be when it gets to that point, when it's actually running it, okay? So does that make sense? There's a relationship between the program counter and the location counter, but the location counter is like a, an early view, you know, a, a projection of the future, but it's not a program counter because this program's not running right now. I hope that makes sense. If, you're, if that's making any sense, um, then uh, a head nod would be great. <laughs> on the, head nod me on the chat so I know that, that you're a, a, awake and that this is making sense to you. I hope, that, uh, hope that's working. And I don't know why. I'm just really tired all of a sudden. Um, okay. All right, thanks, Zach. Zach just moved to the top of my favorites list because everybody else is asleep. And I'm heading there fast. Okay, so number one, we are now doing the assembly process. We're in the first pass, okay? That's a comment. What's going to happen? Nothing. All right? Well, literally, we just don't care. It's a comment. We just throw it away. There's another comment, another comment, right? The comments are built for us. The comments are built for us as the programmers, okay? Uh, it's not built, the, the, the assembler just throws it away. Okay, now we get this one, which is the dot orage. And what that does is now it sets the location counter. And that tells us, okay, that's where this stuff's going to go, Okay. Now it goes to the next instruction, and all it's doing, remember, first pass, all we're doing is building a symbol table, okay? That's all we're about, is building a symbol table on this pass. Second pass, we'll build machine language. So at this point, it's like, is there a symbol? And the answer is no, there's no symbol there. So I just increment the, the LC, imp increment the location counter. And by the way, that guy is a com is a comment, a comment. Another comment, okay. And now that tells us, 
And now we get to an actual label, loop. We put loop in the symbol table. We grab the LC. We tell that, say that's the address. And then we keep going. And we increment the LC. No symbols. So we, we move and we increment the LC again. No symbols. Comment. No effect. Boom. We get a symbol. And the LC is 3005. And then we, we move on. Actually, you know what I'm wondering? I think that guy should have been bumped to 3006. I'm going to back up for a second. Because when you go here and you set up that, that original thing and we do the load, yeah, yeah, you know what should happen is right there when I move on, this guy should be 3006. That's a mistake on my slide. But it never changes again after that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's the thing again. Look back at the code. We already said that we're going to start the whole program at 3001. And so we know that that first instruction, this load, is going to go into 3001. We know that that's going to be 02. That's going to be 03, 04, 05. And so as we go through the thing, right, that's exactly what we get. 02 and 05 for those labels. Okay? Do you guys have any questions? Um, any questions at all? In fact, tell me if you have any questions because I'm going to fix the slide while you, I think I've got like 20 seconds. Right. So if you have any questions, this is your chance. Because otherwise it's going to drive me crazy. Okay. Hee <laughs> hee. See, stuff that I can't do in the classroom as well. Okay. So let me pull back up my comments. Yeah, we got anything? Any questions at all about that? Okay. Anyway, I just want to show you real quick, right? You get to 10, you drop to 3,005. As soon as you bounce off of it, you increment the location counter. Comment doesn't do anything. The end doesn't do anything other than just stop you. Okay, Zach, throw it down, man. Or if you want to keep it off the public, you can throw it down on Discord, which will be a little more private. <laughs> but hey, I think you should take your chances with uh, throwing down. Oh, okay. Um, so here's a question that Zach asked. It's not a bad question at all, man. So do you need to make sure that your new .org you know, when you, when you separately compile, that they don't overlap with any of the other ones. Like your first one was 10 lines. Would it be problematic? And the answer is yes, Zach, it would be problematic. That is not a bad question at all. Um, not a bad question whatsoever. Because what will actually happen here, like in the LC3, we can even do an example of that on the LC3 simulator. Um, uh, but like, for example, if I wrote, if I had like 20 instructions, look, started at 3000, right? Then I put 20 instructions there. Then I have this new one that was like dot orange 3010. And here comes some stuff. It's going to start those and it's going to put them at location 3010. And it's going to overwrite from there, you know, as far as it goes, it'll just trash everything. So you need to, if you're going to do separate, separately compiling with the LC3, You've got to like put it, you know, maybe separate it by a hundred or separate, I mean a hundred hex, right? Or like 50 or some number that you know that you've got enough room. That's pretty critical, okay? Um, and so actually that's the Discord question that other Zach, sorry, two Zachs. Other Zach asked this, that question on Discord. Would it be problematic? Okay, now that was... Uh, 
that was Zach Betty, and then so Zach S, Zach Shattuck, uh, this question is also not a bad question, okay? Not a, not a dumb question at all. Um, is the assembler a huge program written in machine code? Here's the thing. Um, and you have to separate, so I think it's a, it's a fantastic question, okay? You have to separate the LC3 simulator with sort of like, you know, a real, a real computer, okay? In the LC3, the assembler is kind of like built into the simulator. So you just like, you hand the simulator your code and the simulator is like a program running in a browser, right? Or maybe I don't even, I don't, I don't know if it's back on a server or if it just loads everything actively, I'm not sure. But, but in any case, it assembles all that in the browser and then it like loads that into the simulator and then starts the simulator going. All of that is in reality programs running on your laptop, right? Or your desktop. So it's a little bit, um, uh, it's, it's a little bit fake believe, okay? Now, in the real world, what happens is you get your, your, your assembler is just a program that's running. It might be, you know, you might have, I don't know, Xcode or, or you could be command line. You're using, you know, whatever, Linux tools. But whatever you're doing, there's some program running that takes your assembly code and does all these steps and then turns that into um, an object file, which is the binary machine code. But that object file has to be, you know, there's a, typically there's multiple object files and they have to be all kind of like linked together and that makes a program. And so in the Windows world, it, that all would like make a .exe file, okay? So if you ever look in the in the Windows space, you'll see these like .obj files, and the .obj files are the object files, which are the separately compiled code. So like high level code, like C plus plus or C or something, gets compiled into these object modules. And then the libraries have their own little you know extensions, and then this linker shoves all that together, and then the linker. Well, not the linker, but then there's a, what's called a loader that actually puts all that stuff into memory, okay? So we're really oversimplifying that process considerably in LC3 land, okay? We really, really are. Um, and it's, again, it's in order to be just, you know, kind of a little more rudimentary from a teaching perspective. So I hope that makes sense, Zach. Um, and then how are assembly programs stored? In your laptop, desktop, whatever kind of world, just file, usually with an extension like .asm, .asm. Um, so literally, it's like I'm typing, I'm doing my thing, blah, 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 .asm, and then it's just file, just file on the hard disk. And I just, you know, drag and drop it or open it in my assembler or, you know, use it. All right, man. Okay, Zach, uh, those are great questions from... Uh, from both Zachs, from two of the Zachs. There are many Zachs. Um, no, the LC3, Zach, on, on the LC3, there's no operating system. There's no OS at all. There's nothing. It's literally just stripped down hardware, simulated, stripped down hardware with some, with some trap routines, like, in, you know, already there. And that's it. It's super, super stripped down. Therefore, it's, you know, it's unrealistically simple, which also makes it great from a, from a simplicity perspective. Okay. Um, oh, man. Here's the problem. With all this quarantining and self-isolation, uh, I don't know if you guys are doing this, but... Um, it's like I'm becoming more nocturnal. It's like I'm reverting to my reverting to my college days or something. It's just harder to go to bed, you know, when you don't have to get up and fight the commute in the morning. So it's a it's a cascading problem for me. I think you're probably having a similar thing. Um 
Yeah, so so other Zach asks on Discord, well, the third Zach, boom, we're like, represent, wait, Zach's representing, um, uh, let's see, isn't, can we get the, is there, how many Zachs are there anyway? I thought there were four, I think we're missing a Zach. Anyway, so third Zach asks, um, so what is real assembly programming like on a normal computer with an OS? Oh, man, that's a really good question. Um, the answer is, for the most part, it's really, really similar because you're still just... Um, you're still writing stuff that looks like that. Um, the difference is a little bit more kind of like... Um, um, I'll dig... We'll dig some up, okay? I will... I'm making a note... Um, I will drag some up for you. We'll go out to like, you know, GitHub and look for, I don't know, device drivers. It's got to be low-level software, so it's got to be like OS stuff. We could probably grab some out of Linux um, or, or, mm, 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 okay, I have a book. Quick, quick story that is a true story. Linux. Um, actually was a derivative, not of Unix. Not, it wasn't a derivative of Unix. It was certainly trying to replace functionality. But it was a derivative of an operating system that was part of a class, well, a textbook, sorry, for an operating systems class. And uh, Tannenbaum, what was his first name? Man, I'm blanking horribly. I can't even believe it. Andrew Tannenbaum. Was a, he wrote a bunch of textbooks. He was a really prolific and popular textbook writer in the 90s, primarily. And he wrote a book, a, a book for a senior level course on operating systems. And in order to accommodate this, he wrote um, an operating system called Minix. Minix, M-I-N-I-X, okay? And I actually had a course on operating systems in the late 80s. So I guess 80s and 90s. Uh, when was it? Right, 87? Summer of 87. I had this course. And I believe it was actually like version 1.0 of Tannenbaum's operating system book. I, I can go grab it because I've got it somewhere here. Um, and in the, and it was really, it was a great book. It was really a good book. But he basically had built this Minix operating system himself. And it came on like, you could get it on like, like eight five and a quarter inch floppy disks. It came in like a set of floppy disks. And, and I actually had this and used it and you know, installed it. And then he provided all the source code, essentially open sourced it. It's 1987, and he was open sourcing an operating system. But it was all, it was called Minix because it was like mini Unix, right? And he actually included the entire source code for the operating system in the appendix to the book. So all the source code to the OS was actually in the book. When Linus Torvalds, a.k.a. Linus Torvalds, um... When, when, when Linus, Linus, um, I want to see something. When he started to make his own, his own Unix thing, um, he actually started with Minix. He did not just like start from scratch. He started with Minix. So that therefore, the reason he called it Linux was partially because Linus, Linus, and you have to have the X, right? As Linus said once in an interview, you have to have the X because it's like a rule with Unix. Um, but he also said that, that he really did it as a joke. You know, he didn't intend it to stick because he's like, it's just too egotistical. Uh, 
but basically, but Linux also rhymes with Minix. Was it M-I-N-I-X or was it M-I-N-U-X? It was M-I-N-I-X, Minix. Um, anyway, but, but, I happen to have, oh, oh, oh. see, I could never do this. Where are we at? Okay, hang on. Couldn't do this live in class, right? It would be too clunky, but since we're all on our laptops here. Okay. Yeah, I want to show you this real quick because you, you brought it up. Now, this is going to be, unfortunately, can I make that bigger? Can I make it bigger? Zoom in. Okay, there we go. That's bigger. So this is some of the original source code. Come on. Okay. That's just being left justified, I guess. Okay. Now, I have, in fact, back in the day, um, I actually went through all of this source code back then. Um, so... This is not my first time seeing this source code, but the last time I saw this source code was 1987. So, what can I say? Um, so, this is like super low level, bunch of comments. Notice the comments are the same as in LC3 labels, right? There's this thing that in, this is, ah, what well, was this Intel assembly? I believe that this was x86 Intel assembly. I want to say that's what it was, but I'm not 100% sure. But I just want to show you that this is this was real assembly language for an operating system. Um, again, I don't know what all these things do. I'm just looking at it. There was this include file. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is x86 because in x86, remember I talked to you a little bit about how the addressing is all like more convoluted because you had like code segments and data segments and the memory was much more difficult. But notice some things that you'll recognize. Um, you'll notice there's a jump, there's moves, which is moving you know, stuff between the code segment into the AX register, the AX into the data segment, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a call, which would be like a JSR, like a jump to subroutine, moves. Is this interesting? Is this? push there was you know you've got the stack stuff which we don't have in the lc3 calls jump you know to another spot other calls other call uh jump you know and then this is like code to initialize what is this that system call um yes yeah vlad um the x86 every architecture has its own assembly language um, so what do we got? You know, I don't even know what, what all these things are, right? But this is save routines, restart code. Anyway, that's it. So this is just a little bit of the kernel. That's what all that is for, for whatever that's worth. Okay. Um, and so the question um, yeah, they're really not standardized, Vlad. Um, other than the, the idea, the question about, you know, the different... It's so like, yes, ARM has its own assembly because um, they have different instructions, different architecture, right? Different memory layouts, different whatever. But there are some common ideas, and this is why, this is why the LC3... You know, remember, I, I coded professionally in assembly language back in the day... Um, and why I'm still okay with the LC3, because the notion of like moving values into registers, moving values from one register to another, from memory into registers, from registers out to memory, jumping to, sub to subroutines that you can return from, absolute jumps, conditional branches. These are standard. These are, but even the words are different, right? The, you know, like I showed you, there was that JMP instruction 
but the reality is that 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 words, you know, uh, somebody else might call it, you know, something else. I mean, jump's pretty standard, but also a lot of this stuff, a lot of Minix, I remember now, um, a lot of Minix was written in C, which really was, you know, a language built for, um, language uh, built initially to write compilers and operating systems. Um, but, so I just grabbed, here's another one from the Minix kernel. Try to get it big enough that you can see it through the thing. Um, but, right, so anyway, this is a number of assembly code utility routines needed by the kernel. The kernel is the, is the smallest level of the operating system. It's the lowest level that sits right on the hardware. So this is like, well, we need some, we need some things, you know, like, are we on a monochrome monitor, monochrome versus color, uh, disabling interrupts, enabling interrupts, um, Inputting data from an I.O. port, outputting data, right? So our sort of C out, C in, some of those things equivalent, right? And um, anyway, again, you can just see um, a lot of similar things. There's an XOR. Yeah, they've got XOR and subtract. Are you jealous? Are you jealous? Jump not zero, where we have like a branch. Right, we would say in the LC three instead of jump not zero, um, we would say uh, what branch negative or positive, right? Capital B R little N P. But the you see the idea is the same. And then there's just a label pushing a bunch of stuff and then popping it later. Yeah. Anyway, and then it's just these are just low level utility routines. So when anybody needs to use them, that's how they get to them. Okay. Um, let me jump back to, I hope that's interesting. Um, you know, a little diversion. Um, yeah, Brennan, that is old code. That's some old freaking code. And I'm pretty sure that was the 1.0, um, uh, just a GitHub repository with the 1.0 uh, Minix code or the original Minix code, but anyway, okay, back to some of the questions. Um, so Zach Penrod asks, so when you go to write assembly on a computer, do you have to educate yourself about the properties of that computer? Since it may have a different instruction set and memory addressability and there's no virtual machine to bridge compatibility. Yes, absolutely yes. And that's why this thing is called, you know, computer organization. And I don't even think assembly language is in the title. I think of it as computer organization and assembly language programming. But when you go to do assembly language programming, like for example, you couldn't do anything with memory in x86, which is kind of original Intel, unless you understood the memory model of the x86 you know, which had code segments, data segments, a segment and an offset. It was like this weird, my recollection is that it was a 20-bit address, but, you know, with 16-bit registers. And so you had to like take 16 bits and overlay it with another 16 bits to get the offset. I don't remember, maybe Adam, I'm not, I don't really remember. But um, anyway, uh, yeah. So let's see, what else? Um, these are really great questions, super, super great questions. Uh, the other thing, you know, we might want to throw out, just realized, was, did I ever, did we ever look at the Raspberry Pi stuff? Anybody remember? Okay, here we go. Okay, um, hang on a second. Mm. Sorry, that's not what I'm looking for. 
Come on, man. Come on. Ah, here we go. This right here, my friends, is a... I think this is what we call a bad boy. Uh, this is... This is the ARM, you know, reference manual. Check it out if you can see up top. <laughs> 1,376 pages. This, my friends, this is why um, I'm, you know, okay out of the shoot with like LC3, you know, it's like a, it's like a small caliber firearm that kind of shoots blanks. You can't really hurt yourself. You know, this is like the real thing. And I'm kind of, um, pivoting over here just so I can see it better on my big screen. But, um, so this is just monstrous big. Where are we at? Okay, let's get some. So if you wanted to really be a hardcore embedded programmer doing assembly in the Raspberry Pi space, this is your 1,300 pages. Get, get used to it. Get going. Um, that's what you really need to fully understand if you're going to really master all of it. Um, so that's just kind of an overview to the architecture, which starts on page A122. Then comes kind of the, uh, like here, the programmer's model, right? Like what are the registers? In fact, let's, um, let me see. about the profiles, blah, blah. Nah. Um, come on. How do I jump back on preview? Does anyone know? I don't think I've ever actually done that. Oh, it's probably go back. Okay, command that guy. Okay. Yeah, so if I go here to like registers, there you go. We got all the registers are 32-bit. I got R0 through R12, all right? Now we've got in the LC3, R0 through R7. Um, these guys have an R13, which is the stack pointer. We got a link register. I'm not exactly sure what that is. There is a program. Oh, check it out. The program counter, instead of being separated, is actually one of the registers yeah and then other stuff so you get these like more specialized registers and um if we go back to there's stuff about the stack pointer i'm just trying to see stuff that might be interesting oh let's say like the memory model okay and then this kind of tells you you know that this is a the address space is a single flat address space of two to the thirty second bytes. Now you guys ought to immediately know some things about about uh, what the memory address register, right? How many bits in that memory address register in that MAR? Huh? Huh? Anybody? Bueller. You know the answer to that one. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit about, um, you know, the address space and, um, right. And so byte addresses are unsigned numbers in the ranges from zero to two to the 32nd minus one. This is the part where I hope that you say to yourselves, fetch man, Dr. K was not like lying or throwing bull crap at us when he was when we had to run some exercises where the answers were things like, uh, you know, from zero to two to the N minus one. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So you got this 32 bit, 32 bit addresses, right? Um, anyway, bunch of stuff. It's just, it's just stuff after stuff. That's all the memory model stuff, system addresses, Ah, debugging stuff. Oh, the instruction set. Yeah, there we go. There we go. This starts to get us to um, format of instruction descriptions, teaching you how to read the manual, basically. Pseudocode. What are we doing? OK, 
conditional instructions, add equal, sub equal, add not equal, sub not equal. That's kind of, right? You can see how these are like um, uh, larger uh, collections. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like more complex things that you're building out of other things. Use of labels, using syntax information, assembler syntax fields, conditional execution. Ooh, there we go. Here we go. So here we go. So we got these are these are op codes um, for the. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. These are condition codes, okay? And this is their meaning. And anyway, this is this is fourteen hundred pages of madness, right? So it takes a while, takes a while to get familiar, you know, to really understand how that whole thing's working. And if this is your world, you dive in, you, you figure it out, you, you use the documentation. So, so once again, there's this kind of open question, I think, about um, whether we, you know, to what extent would it make sense to use the Raspberry Pi instead of the LC3 for 2810? It's still, to me, it's an open question. So anyway, your feedback, you know, remains super valuable to me. So, okay, let me jump, uh, let me get rid of that. But that's what you're in for if you want to go hardcore um, Raspberry Pi. Now, if I did do Raspberry Pi for, for this class, uh, what I would basically do is distill through, this is why I need a summer to do it. I need to distill through that entire documentation, get the memory model, get the various maps of whatever in my head. Um, and then you can easily see that where you've got stack pointers, the program counters in a different kind of space, the tools are going to be different, that it would basically, starting at about module five, it would start to be, you know, a different class. I'd have to redo all the stuff, you know, to make it make sense. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the, we're going to, I got to finish this before we're out today. The assembly process. So the second pass is, I'm just checking to see if we got any more questions. The second pass is where we convert it to machine code. We built the symbol table. Okay. And we're going to roll again. We're just going to start on in. And I think I had, hang on a second. Okay, just a second. I just wanted to make sure I got my comments where I can see them coming down the pipe. Okay. So we're going again, only this time we're going to, this is our second pass. So what do we do? Now notice that what we did the first time was we just kind of grayed out the ones we didn't care about, you know? So we're still going to do that. And, but now we're going to go like, Throw it away, throw it away, throw it away, right? Don't care. And by the way, you notice that there's nothing about, that's just comments. Comments are to us. They don't have any impact on, you know, what's in memory. When you do this stuff, the very first thing that shows up in memory is that load R1 from location 10. That's the very first spot in memory in our program, okay? Because the comments were just to us. The assembler throws them away. The dot .orig was an instruction to the assembler, it does this. It says LC is going to be 3001 and then it throws it away because that's, it still hasn't built any, it hasn't built any code, hasn't built any machine code at all. Now we're finally ready to build machine code. Okay, now let's break this thing down. We've got, remember we've got, in case that last step from here to there, that freaked anybody out. Because um, what happens here is we've got the symbol table, right? We know what, what the locations are going to represent in code. But what we're doing now is we're saying, okay, we got to load from R1 LD um, from the location 10 into R1. Now, location 10 is 3005, okay? Now, 
what we're basically doing is we're now doing essentially a PC offset. Okay, this is just calculating the PC offset. We take the we take the LC, which is the location counter, which is the address of this instruction. And if we didn't have the 20 second delay, you'd quickly respond to this question because I know you know the answer. When we do PC offset, you know, what is that offset from? And the answer is not just the PC, but the incremented program counter. Okay. Well, so the LC is the address of this instruction. The PC, when it's actually running, will have already been incremented. It's the incremented program counter. That's why we've got to take 3001 and add one to it. That becomes the incremented program counter. Then we take the, the location of this symbol called 10 and we just subtract the program counter from it. So whether that thing was above it or below it, it's gonna work. It's either gonna be a negative offset or a positive offset, but it's gonna be an offset from the incremented program counter, okay? Everybody cool with that? And that gives us 3003, okay? So I'm an idiot, sorry, not three. I was, I, sorry, I was blanking. No, it gives us three, which is in fact, when this program is running, right? And the program counter is on this instruction, it's gonna be one, two, three, okay? You should be able to see that that works as a PC offset, okay? Where the PC at that point when it's running will be 3002. But right now, it, the LC is 3001 because that's the instruction we're dealing with right now, okay? Now, the next step is this is the part you already know how to do, right? I take that LD and I'm like, oh, that's 0010. That's the LD instruction. You see it? Destination register is one, offset is three. That's the machine format of that LD instruction. Is this coming together? You buying? I hope you're buying what I'm selling here. Okay? And, and this guy over here, by the way, that's just telling me what location in memory, which is 3001. Um, okay? Then... I'm all good. I increment, by the way, when I'm done with that, I increment the location counter. I'm like, throw away the comment. Okay, now I'm doing the add instruction. There's the next step. Now it turns out I don't have to do anything fancy with the add instruction. I'm ready to convert this guy to machine language. I already know what the opcode is for add. I've got a destination register, a source register, and a literal value. Those are all, that's just what goes in Right? When I was doing this one with, a, with a, a label, I had to calculate the PC offset. So it was a little more clunky. Right? So I had to do those steps. Here, I'm ready to go. Boom. What does that say? 4-bit opcode. That's add, register 1, register 1. Bit 5 says it's an immediate value. Boom. Immediate value, which is negative 1. See it? That's it. Um, so that was easy. And then I've incremented the location. I didn't really like light it up, but I've incremented the, the, the location counter after that one, which means this guy is the address that's going to live in location 3003. He has a branch on positive to, to loop, and loop is up here in our symbol table. He's 3002. Now, once again, that branch does the PC offset. So I gotta take the location counter, which is me, the address of this instruction, take it and make it into what the incremented program counter is going to be. So I gotta add one. I take the label, 3002, and I subtract the incremented program counter from it, okay? And that gives me an offset. Is that working? Yeah, that's right, because it's a negative number, right? So I'm going to branch on positive to that distance. You see that that's a negative number? You see it? That's a 16-bit negative number, okay? 
Then I go and I do the conversion. Um, the branch is that guy right there, the, the all zeros. These are the condition codes, which is NZP. So that's the positive. I care about the positive. And then that is negative whatever. What is that? Negative two? Yeah, yeah, it's negative two. Um, okay. Then the halt again is straightforward. I don't have to do any conversions. Halt is a trap instruction and it's trap 25. So I go here and that's the trap op code. And that is, and when I say 25, I do mean hex 25. So that is, see the first four bits? Where's my mouse? There we go. First four bits is two. The next four bits is five, two, five. So that is trap two, five. Now this part, how are we doing on time? We're almost out of time, but track with me on this part, okay? This is really important because some of this is still mysterious to some of you and, the, and the, the tumblers have not clicked, but watch what happens. Here comes this dot fill, right? Dot fill, um, zero, zero, zero A, which we know to be the decimal value 10. Um, what happens here? Well, this is a directive to the assembler. Remember that? This is a pseudo-op. It's an instruction to the assembler. And it says, whenever you get here, which location counter says is location 3005, I just want you to put this value. Now watch. That's it. You see it? All it does, all that dot fill did was took that value 000A in hex. Boom. There's zero, there's zero, there's zero, and there's A, right? A is 10, A plus two is 10, okay? And then when I get to the end, I'm done. Boom, that's our program. Ha! Huh. That's it, that's, that is the mystery. Then when you're done, you get programs like the ones you've been writing in machine language, but you started you know, back, you started with this, okay? You wrote that program in assembly, and then the thing went through this process, built the symbol table, and now went through and made all that machine language, and boom, there you go. Everybody good with that? We're basically, we're basically out of time for today. Uh, well, no, not basically, we got, we got a minute or two. But I just want you to, you got to go back through this thing and make sure this is really fluent. You've got to understand this process, okay? And if you're just, you know, piece by piece connecting the dots, you should, you should be getting it. This last part, by the way, it's literally only one more slide, and I already, I already talked about it, which is you can build more than one of these files, and you can link them together into an executable file. That's all that, that's really all that's trying to say. And we already had a conversation about it, okay? So, um, any lingering questions? Boy, my back hurts. Um, this chair is not, it's not working for me for this, but um, I'm going to just hang tight for just any lingering questions. I'll, you know, wait like a minute before I kill the live stream. But that's it. So, that actually gets us out of, um, out of chapter 7, module 8. All right. And what we're going to talk about on Thursday is the project. And typically I just spend one day on that project. The rule of module eight, there's no homework and there's no exam on module eight. When you have finished the module exams one through eight and then 10, you just get credit for module nine. It's like a progress kind of a thing. And uh, later on, I'll build in some assignment stuff to have you actually do some design stuff. Um, I might still do that for the, for the project. I just want you to be thinking about the project design, um, which is already posted, so you can go look at it. But um, uh, So Thursday, we're going to talk about the project. That'll be a little harder to do. I may... I'm not quite sure. I do have a whiteboard behind me, which I need to get up on the wall. And maybe we can just do some whiteboard discussion, which I would have done 
you know, in class. So, um, and then when we're back, we've just got 10, 11, 12 and two weeks to do it, which is actually, I know it feels fast, but it's just, they're, they're much, much smaller. Okay. Anybody else? If you got any questions, I'm just going to stick around for a minute. And then of course we've got, um, you know, testing lobby, uh, showing up, you know, pretty much just right after this, you need to take exams. I really am tired. Yeah, Zach, so, so Zach in the Discord asked, said you might have misunderstood it, but no, there is a, there is a, there is a Module 8 homework. Um, I was talking about Module 9. I may have misspoken. I may have misspoken. Um, but yeah, there is no Module 9 homework. Module 9 basically is like start designing, thinking about designing the project is what Module 9 is really about. And if I were to put a, a homework in, which I might still do, I would have you be thinking about the design of the, uh, of the project. So, yeah, and Zach, that's what I was just saying about Module 9 exam is that there is not a Module 9 exam. Once you've done the module exams 1 through 8 and then 10, you get credit for 9. Rock and roll. Okay. I'm going to, by the way, somehow try to figure out how to get the... Uh, I'll get it figured out. I'll get the, uh, the, chat, um, the, uh, the chat messages from Discord um, onto the live stream. I've just got to do a little bit of configuration. I can get it. Thank you, Abby. I'm going to take a nap. Maybe or maybe not. I'm not sure. So, all right, everybody. Uh, take care. Um, I'm going to shut this thing down. <laughs>